The Decalogue is the law of Moses. According to legends, it was received by Moses from God during the end phase of the Israelites' deliverance from their subjection to slavery in Egypt some 3,500 years ago. While the existence of Moses and of the Exodus, as described in legends in several biblical books, are disputed by archaeologists, Egyptologists, experts of biblical criticism, archaeological evidence, and historical evidence too, and so on, citing logical inconsistencies. The great law of Moses that came out of these legends stands nevertheless undisputed to the very day is one of the greatest, longest enduring, and most influential laws of all times. If one looks closely, it comes to light as a work of scientific genius. As the name states, the Decalogue is a structure of Ten Commandments. In the scientific sense, however, it comes to light as a two-part structure, one part presents a single active commandment, a supreme divine imperative. This opening element is followed by a string of nine directives that are passive in nature. The directive lists things that one shouldn't do. Ironically, the passive directives which bid us not to do this and not to do that are generally regarded to be the law, while the first commandment, the real imperative, is deemed to be just an introduction. This paradox is not surprising because in later biblical books about this law, a string of severe penalties were assigned for infractions of the passive aspects, in many cases demanding the death penalty. This penal type concept eventually led to such absurdities as to render God a penal institution, demanding society to murder one another in the name of God, as has been done for centuries. If one looks closer, however, the structure of the Decalogue is much more beautiful than that. It begins with one statement of law followed by nine statements of divine promise of what civilization will be when this one single active imperative, the first commandment of the law, is being fulfilled. In the case of the five last commandments, the promise of the law is, when the law is fulfilled, that society shall not see any murders in its civilization, and theft, adultery, untruthfulness, and greed for possessions. Thus, in respect to the imperative of the law, if one were to ask how does one know when the active commandment is fulfilled, then the logical answer to this question would be, we would see the promise realized that is embedded in the nine elements that we would then no longer see happening. The answer is, that the law can only be fulfilled in this manner. It is never fulfilled by fear of punishment, or willpower, or sacrifice, or blind obedience. These are all passive. Let's look at the first column, for example. When the number one imperative is fulfilled, that is, when it becomes understood that God is the universe, with men included, as a leading-edge element of the unfolding creative flow, then it becomes impossible for one to commit murder or to allow it to be committed, or even to contemplate it. In this context, the two elements are opposite. They are mutually exclusive. But there is more than that involved here. 
The setup invites one to discover and embrace the active principle that makes it impossible for the passive imperative to be violated, which in this context becomes merely a type of checkpoint on the road of spiritual development. For example, if it becomes understood that God is life, the substance of all life and living, then the understood principle makes it imperative that the directive not to commit murder be honored, and not only be merely honored, but that the value that the principle brings to light be celebrated. In this case, it invites an active celebration of the value of life. This takes us far beyond what a passive compliance with morality can achieve. It brings light to civilization. This has far-reaching implications. For example, when the number one imperative is fulfilled, whereby the imperative becomes an active celebration of life, then the entire system of empire that has murdered humanity for millennia invariably becomes history. Every empire that ever was has enforced its existence by murdering society in countless ways to maintain its domination, such as by creating conditions for starvation. Even now in modern time, the greatest empire in history that now claims to be the world empire is a murderer by design. It demands universal murder on a gigantic scale. It demands the rapid depopulation of the earth from the present seven billion people to less than one billion. That's a stated policy. The goal of the policy is to re-establish a feudal landscape, the most stable landscape for an oligarchic system to exist in. The goal is to get back to that. That's officially stated. For this policy, 100 million people are murdered every year with the biofuels project that burns food at a rate that had previously nourished 200 to 400 million people. In a starving world, this means mass murder on a gigantic scale. That's the obvious objective because the biofuels process is not a net energy producer or only marginally so at best, and it nearly doubles the CO2 output that it claims to reduce, which renders it a lie. But it is efficient in producing genocide and destroying the humanity of society. In ancient times, the ruling oligarchs or priests required society to actively participate in the murdering of people from their community who had violated the priestly rules. It required a community to throw stones at a victim until the victim would die of the injuries they inflicted. This dehumanizing effect on society is demanded again with the biofuels process as society is demanded to burn food while facing a starving world. Yes, we are miles off the mark of celebrating the value of life. Every time we go to the gas pump to buy gasoline diluted with food, we step into this veil. We lose a bit of the essence of our humanity. We have a choice to resist it and buy undiluted gasoline. The people in the poor countries don't have this choice. There are vast tracts of land 
that once produced food for human living are bought up by the West to produce products for biofuels to meet the rich countries' quotas. At the gas pump, we are literally required to throw stones at victims in far-off lands who we never knew, whom we condemned to die by the millions by our collective actions, aiding the crime that murders potentially 100 million people a year with hunger. Our modern collective crime pales Hitler's Holocaust. So one may ask, is the Decalogue too extreme when it urges us to celebrate life as a precious aspect of the divine nature, the light of civilization? Hardly. The Decalogue is too soft. It is our ignoring it that has become extreme extreme in consequences. When one looks closer, the entire lower row of the Decalogue presents critical details that are related to the nature of the oligarchic system that maintains itself by controlling, dominating, impoverishing, and destroying the platform of civilization. Each aspect of it is debilitating in the larger context, and is thereby inherently murderous in nature. This combines the entire lower row functionally into one. In the same manner, the elements on the top row are related. They expand in detail on the challenge that is inherent in acknowledging the nature of an infinite God and man's dynamic being with it. For example, pertaining to number two, when it is acknowledged that God is all in all, it becomes impossible to seek out other gods such as money, status, power, prestige, fame, and so on. For number three, the recognition that God is manifest in life and at its leading edge in man, it makes it impossible to seek out dead objects that have no value and power in civilization. For number four, the recognition that God is infinite mind closes the door on small-minded thinking and attitudes that add up to so many tragic denials of God in whom we have our being. Small-minded thinking is one of the poison pills that becomes tragically debilitating in this environment. For number five, the recognition that God is the soul and substance of all good inspires a sense of awe for the magnitude and quality of good. The recognitions are for our benefits, because in them we begin to see and value our own nature reflected. If we fail in these regards, we fail ourselves at the most fundamental level that we would build on. Of course, if we fail in any of these regards, we do so because there is something spiritually lacking in our understanding of God, in whom our being is anchored in all respects. Now let's add some more definitions to the nine key elements that serve as checkpoints for the attainment in understanding God and ourselves with it. Let's focus on the lower row again. If we fail to develop the active principles that meet the various passive demands, then empire rules supreme and wrecks everything instead of divine principle being expressed in civilization as the ruling and creative power. 
without the divine light in the heart. Darkness rules, empire rules. The darkness breaks civilization. It even breaks the bonds between people that love has forged. As the imperial philosopher Thomas Hobbes has demanded, the darkness that denies the divine spirit and so on as the image of man breaks economics, science, and makes war. Tragically, we see a lot of this today. The fact that we see these tragedies means that our perception of God is too small, too limited, too incomplete, and in many cases is completely wrong altogether. This also means that when we see the green pest ruling the lower scene, we have work to do on the number one issue. The pesky green elements, therefore, cannot really be cleared up individually. They can only be cleared collectively at the number one level. If we fail anywhere on the green level, we could work to do at the number one level. For example, we have tried for 50 years to eradicate nuclear war. We have failed. We have failed because we have failed to recognize the universal divine nature of the human being and to build on this recognition. We have denied it instead of cultivating it and developing its essence. The top row, from two to five, is likewise full of tragic denials. These are the prime denials of the nature of God, which become reflected below in the corresponding denial of the nature of man. It appears that the vertical interrelationship between the two rows is scientifically intentional. For example, in column three, if we become entangled with dead processes, processes that do not support life, such as the accumulation of gold or free trade looting, or financial looting instead of developing an economy with our creative and productive powers by which the divine spirit fulfills the human needs, then we see no option open to us for a richer life other than to steal what we need. Thereby we break the principle of economics. The we is individual as much as it is collective. The entire casino orgy of financial derivatives gambling, for example, falls into this category, which has become a monster song with a whopping $1,500 trillion now riding the dice in the financial markets casino. This volume pales the entire world's economic product many times tenfold. When the gambling orgy is measured in the quadrillions, the game is huge. A small tremor can wreck entire nations with economic collapse. This has been done. It has wrecked Cyprus and many countries of the Eurozone. This game has essentially brought the entire world economy to the breaking point. The world has moved so far on this road, away from anything that is rational and human and divine, that the trumpet is sounded ever louder for nuclear war and for depopulation instead of rebuilding the creative spirit of humanity. From the deep darkness of an empty heart that is devoid of the reflection of divine soul, envy flows in broad streams. Envy, 
that inspires stealing. In this increasing flow of emptiness, the soldiers of this void reach out to war and wage war. The war here is waged ever more to destroy the good that has been built and has been created. Nuclear war serves this purpose well and no other purpose because it leaves nothing in its wake but a scorched earth in which no one can live. It is here where we find two groups of directives attached to the Decalogue that serve as a warning. One of these urges society to keep the Sabbath day holy and to honor one's father and mother. This warning is attached to number five. The two parts of this directive in element five are one in essence. The Sabbath day gives one a break from the routine of labor with the focus on spiritual and cultural development. To honor one's father and mother goes in line with promoting this critical development the honoring here is an honoring of the wisdom that years of caring for a family tends to inspire. What else than spiritual development can raise the soul towards the infinite and block the cultivated madness that allows war and preparations for even nuclear war? The world has a destructive force of 500,000 Hiroshima mass deployed against itself. This is evidence of a gross lack of spiritual development. The warning that the Decalogue feels is justified thereby. In fact, the warning is largely understated. Seconds after this photo was taken, President Kennedy was murdered. When the picture was taken, the world scene was optimistic and set on a course of universal economic development. Seconds later, the president was destroyed beyond recovery by a bullet. In the space of these seconds, the world was changed in a manner that it has not recovered from. The conflict that the president had ordered to withdraw from was escalated into the Vietnam War that raged for a decade. The moon landing mission was terminated. The economy was severely damaged. World development was turned into escalating destruction. In a nuclear war, the world is changed as fast as Kennedy's tragedy unfolded. One moment, the world is whole. A moment later, it is irreparably doomed. President Kennedy's heart stopped 30 minutes after the trigger was pulled. It takes slightly longer to achieve the same for much of humanity, for which the weapons of nuclear war are actively deployed. This is what we face today because the spiritual development has been lacking to prevent this deployment. That's the warning of the Decalogue. Is anyone listening? The same type of interrelationship can also be recognized between the two other columns. Element 7 is a cherished one in the oligarchic system. It is designed to block the principle of universal love. Thus, the 17th century imperial philosopher Thomas Hobbes, on whom empires were built, demanded that love be kept out of the realm of business, government, state, including everything, except the smallest private domain where it can be tolerated by the masters of empire. 
He rendered it a capital crime to pollute the works of empires and state with universal love. In scientific terms, the severe circumcision of love that cuts away over 90% of its power in civilization and throws it away as trash is a gross adulteration of the nature of divine love that uplifts and enriches all. It has been said that when love would be banished altogether, civilization would collapse. We are close to that. The massive burning of food and the policy for the depopulation of the planet to less than one billion people are gross examples of how close we have drifted to the point of collapse of civilization. When love is choked out of the heart, we can be sure that God, the all-in-all -all love, the foundation for civilization, has been banished from consciousness. In the column that combines elements four and nine, the masters of empire subject truth to the same banishment, which thereby breaks the power of science. Truth has become displaced with lies, secrecy, slander, deception, coercion, and so on, which essentially banishes God, mind, from the human universe. In this cultivated, small-minded environment, the Ice Age challenge that now stands before us cannot be recognized, much less be met. Because of this failure, the infrastructures for continued agriculture will not be built whereby the whole of humanity may become lost. The decapitation of science by cultivated smallness in scientific perception is not easily dealt with, as the tragedy of the global warming hoax illustrates. It may have been for this reason that another warning has been attached to the Decalogue. This other warning has been attached to element number four. The warning states that if we mess up or on this count, the consequences will be suffered by our children to the fourth generation. This appears to be a harsh warning, though justified by the evidence that it seems to take that long to cleanse the landscape of science of disabling concepts, shallow pursuits, and related indoctrinations. In real terms, the warning is too soft. If disabled science blocks us from meeting the Ice Age challenge, the consequences will be suffered to the four thousandth generation, because once the Ice Age begins, the resources are lost that enable us to create an Ice Age Renaissance for our boundless freedom in living. This means that our future, even our future existence, literally depends on the fulfillment of the first commandment that impels a fuller and richer recognition of the divine substance and intelligence is the one all in all that is reflected as man and the universe. Whenever we break science and make war, we gain a glimpse of the consequences of losing ourselves, our divine nature. In the degree that this losing ourselves is escalated, we approach our self-extinction either in the coming Ice Age or in nuclear war. The Decalogue warns us that the dangers of losing ourselves are getting ever more severe the farther we go down this path. It also points out the path of healing, 
that gets us back home to our humanity where we ought to be, which is embedded in the first commandment. All forms of healing flow from the substance of the first commandment in which we find ourselves becoming recognized, understood, and acknowledged. Christ Jesus had been the most accomplished man on this platform. He had been the greatest healer on the spiritual platform of our divine humanity in the history of the world. As a healer, Christ Jesus saw the human problem as failures in society, self-recognition as a lacking in its divine recognition. On this platform, by rebuilding the focus on divine spirit as the heart of man, he healed everything. We can do so likewise. In fact, we are doing this already, and possibly to a much greater degree than we give ourselves credit for. Without it, we wouldn't have a civilization. Without this focus, we deny ourselves and one another. Everything that is precious in the world that is living, creating, building, discovering, caring, loving, protecting, nurturing, elevating, and so on, is wrapped up in the number one focus, the focus on the divine spirit that is the heart of man, the number one imperative, the first commandment. The quality of our civilization, even whether we will continue to have one in the future, depends on the value we place on the number one factor, the factor of the first commandment. Christ Jesus is said to have emphasized this point when he was asked by a lawyer of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Master, which is the great commandment in the law? He is reported to have answered, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And he added that this includes the imperative Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And he added further that on these two imperatives, which in essence he defined as one, hang all the law and the prophets. What he said was evidently not a speech of empty words. He gave us his famous Lord's Prayer, that is focused totally on the divine substance being the substance of humanity and civilization, he presented the prayer in four groups of two elements that are progressive in nature. The first in each group presents an understanding which is immediately followed by an acknowledgement. The phrase, Our Father, which art in heaven, reflects an understanding which is acknowledged as, Hallowed be thy name. The same applies for the six remaining elements. I won't get into more details here. I have explored the details of this structure in a separate video with the title, Science of the Lord's Prayer. I am merely aiming to illustrate here that the structures of the eight elements of the Lord's Prayer is logically reflected in the essence of the last four columns of the Decalogue. You may agree that the four columns of the Lord's Prayer match in essence the four columns of the Decalogue. You may also agree that the focus of both structures is to gain a fuller and richer apprehension of the nature of God and of man as a leading-edge expression of God. 
it may well be that the resulting coincidence is intentional so that the Lord's Prayer may have been built onto the Decalogue as both structures are scientific instruments for gaining universal freedom, the freedom found in the universal fullness of God. Thus the Decalogue was evidently not designed as a platform against something to limit human freedom, but was instead designed as a positive imperative that builds and expands human freedom. Like the Lord's Prayer, the Decalogue builds up our power to be free from limitation and from small-minded pursuits that are tragically limiting. Thus, the Decalogue stands as a scientific platform to build the type of freedom on in which the oligarchic system of empire that humanity is presently imprisoned in to a large degree, falls by the wayside. This appears to be the prime function that the Decalogue is designed to fulfill, because the system of empire and oligarchy, be it to small degrees or large degrees, individually or collectively, is the counterpole to the divine reality. Like darkness is the absence of light. With this reasoning, we get back to the point that the Decalogue presents a single imperative with nine promises attached that are falsely seen as directives, which are but statements of conditions that we will find when the active imperative is honored. In other words, when the law is fulfilled, one shall not find murder anywhere in the world and thievery, deception, lies, and so on. The Decalogue also makes plain that its promises remain unfulfilled to the degree to which there is something spiritually lacking in fulfilling the number one law, the prime law, the only law, the law that everything depends on, the law which inspires us to understand the power and the greatness and the good that we embody as human beings. It inspires us to acknowledge that murdering is contrary to the nature of men and stealing, lying, and confiscating. For example, the planned financial bail-in process that confiscates society's bank deposits to pay for the bank's gambling losses is, like any form of war, totally contrary to the nature of humanity and civilization. Civilization is a system of building, creating, growing, and developing that reflects the divine qualities. Empire is the opposite system to the system of civilization. It is devoid of humanity. Oligarchy is a system of confiscating and of destroying what cannot be confiscated. It is fascism that denies civilization and everything that reflects the divine qualities and characteristics that are manifest throughout the universe. The Decalogue thereby establishes not only the principle of monotheism, meaning the allness of God, Spirit, but with it, it also establishes the only possible platform that is able to support a civilization of human beings on this planet. This may have been understood in ancient times for which the Decalogue was created in the first place. Was the Decalogue received by Moses then from God, engraved in stone? Or is the entire legend of Moses symbolic to illustrate a profound spiritual point? The knowledge of spiritual imperatives evidently preceded the dawn of the written languages. In the legend, 
Moses is linked to the river Nile. He is taken from the river, as it were, the river system that became one of the cradles of civilization, together with Mesopotamia and the Indus Valley. Egypt and Mesopotamia were poles of the great fertile crescent that would likely have seen continuous population movements between them, especially since both regions are unequally affected by changing climate patterns. The vast river system of Mesopotamia has its source in the northern region that is vulnerable to drought conditions. In comparison, the Nile has its source in the equatorial region where rainfall is plentiful and dependable as the result of the upwelling air currents in the intertropical convergence zone. The dependable agriculture along the Nile would have brought people into Egypt during the drought conditions who took Egyptian culture back home with them upon their return. The Decalogue may have been one of the items of culture that spread along this route from Egypt. It was likely developed in Egypt by an early priesthood of monotheistic ideology that may have had its origin in advanced cultures that emerged from the last Ice Age like that of the builders of the Giza pyramids. If one compares the pyramids that were built during the times of the pharaohs to serve as their burial places, with the great Giza pyramids, it becomes apparent that the pyramids of the pharaohs were primitive imitations. The Giza pyramids are of a class unsurpassed to the present day in equality and design and precision of construction. They far supersede what the Egyptians had been able to achieve. Contrary to the claims of Egyptology, the Giza pyramids were likely built 12,800 years ago according to the alignment of the Sphinx with its image in the sky in the form of the constellation Leo. In this case, the Giza complex would have been built by a culture intensely familiar with the sky, as an advanced culture would have been under the dark sky of the Ice Age. The Giza pyramids are so far advanced in mathematical features, sheer physical size, and fine precision in alignment and construction details that they stand today as monuments of wonders from an ancient world. There is no way possible that these feats of human genius and creativity that the Giza complex presents us would have been possible in an oligarchy imperial civilization. It is interesting to note that the positioning of the pyramids closely matches the alignment of the stars of Orion's belt, to which also specific references are built into the pyramids themselves. The point is that the ancient builders had developed a keen scientific sense on a wide range of subjects, and in this context had developed a recognition of an intricate unity among humanity and the universe, and a recognition of a divine spirit and mind being reflected in all. The Giza pyramids represent a quality of culture that has been lost of which only minute aspects appear to have remained, some of which were later compiled into a code of law that was eventually written down and then presented, highly enriched with theatrical drama, spiritual discoveries and political imperatives, according to the need of the times. In today's world, but a shadow cast in stone remains, 
of what was once in the grand theater of history, in which a man, later named Moses, had played a role in providing a link between the, a past that was fast fading and an uncertain future that was shrouded in the unknown. It is unfortunate that the culture of the ancient builders has become lost so completely that no knowledge has remained of how the feat was done. The culture of the builders may have perished in the cataclysmic events that appeared to have buried much of the Sahara with a shower of sand, perhaps derived from a swarm of asteroids intruding into the Earth's atmosphere. If such was the case, the intruding asteroids would have been fractured into dust by the electric contact with the ionosphere, similar to, only much larger in scale, than the Tunguska event in Siberia in 1908 that had instantly leveled 2,000 square kilometers of forest. Rock drawings in the Sahara indicate that today's great desert was once a lush region with rivers, swamps, and abundant wildlife. This engraving of a sleeping antelope would not have been created if the animal had not lived there. Today the region is a barren sea of sand with only engravings remaining of the evidently once green landscape that supported wildlife. The culture of the builders of the pyramids was likely buried with the animals that lived there. Of the civilization of the builders, only a small remnant may have remained. It may have been those few who may have preserved in their own living the spiritual knowledge of the great builders. These few may have become the leaders and teachers in the new civilization when the region was resettled and became what is now called Egypt. When Egypt became imperial in nature, which is the opposite trend to spiritual development, the spiritual priests may have feared the loss of the monotheistic spiritual culture that they had brought with them from their, by then, ancient background. The system of empire and oligarchy is built on the denial of the spirit of the universe, the spirit of God being reflected in man and humanity. By its very nature, the system of empire and oligarchy is a system of blindness that denies the value of man and its creative and productive capacity, its science, its intelligence, and so on, that reflects the boundless capacities of divine mind reflected in men. Thus, the system of empire excuses its master's freedom to enslave society, steal from it, to destroy its culture and science, and to control it with fascism and war and degenerative idealism that generates a sense of impotence. The system of empire and oligarchy and all of these destructive elements combined are one single package, and this one is what may be termed the infinite crime. This package is lifeless. It is a dead horse. Its heart is useless wealth. Its deity is made of stone. When the spiritual priests saw Pharaoh turning his face towards this death of lifeless ideals, they saw the writing on the wall. Thus, they seemed to have codified and summarized what they knew and spared no effort to convey it to whoever would listen. They also may have engaged other cultures that had come to Egypt, 
who would still be inspired and may have aided these visitors on their return home from Egypt to serve as carriers in their heart of the spiritual treasure that was no longer safe to endure in imperial Egypt. Moses was probably one of the spiritual priests. He evidently played a critical role in preserving the science of monotheism that bestows incredible value unto man. It may have been through Moses' effort, in conjunction with other cultures, that the monotheist ideology was spread through the old world that was mainly concentrated throughout the Fertile Crescent. To some degree, the Mosaic efforts appear to have succeeded as the monotheistic ideology remains widely recognized and honored to some degree. The success, though, at the time of Moses, appears to have been small. Much of it was lost when Mesopotamia became an empire that extended itself far and wide and even overtook the ancient culture of Egypt. And so, Babylon, that once stood at the center of the cradle of civilization, became the whore of Babylon, as it was referred to in Bible language, when it became an empire of oligarchy, with all that the package includes. Babylon became an empire, or, in, or incorporated into an empire that spread its dark wings from the Mediterranean all the way to India. It may have been the beginning of that which Isaiah lamented in chapter 14, saying, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Still, in spite of the spreading, dehumanizing culture of war, dominion, quests for power, and so on, the Decalogue has remained standing in the background of human culture and was maintained through the ages and grew in recognition of its substance to slowly become a supporting foundation for civilization. It still stands today. Moses is honored throughout the world for his fundamental law, including in the halls of America's capital. The Decalogue is also still honored for its substance, perhaps even more so than ever. America's spiritual pioneer, Mary Baker Eddy, the founder of Christian Science, wrote, The first commandment is my favorite text. It demonstrates Christian Science. It inculcates the triunity of God, spirit, mind. It signifies that men shall have no other spirit or mind but God, eternal good, and that all men shall have one mind. Mary Baker Eddy also saw it as a keystone of spiritual science. She is reported to have said to one of her longtime secretaries, You are spirit. If God is spirit and is all in all, then all is spirit, including us. This applies to all that God is, life, truth, love, mind, soul, principle, intelligence, and substance. This is the essence of the first commandment, that we recognize ourselves in the same terms in which we recognize God, that is, with the same quality and characteristic, rather than seeing ourselves as small underlings to anything, much less as underlings to empire. It appears that this 
had been understood in ancient times, or else the pyramids could not have been built. When people look at the pyramids today, they say that what they see is not possible for a primitive people to build. They say that aliens from outer space must have built them. They say that these gigantic marvels in stone can't be built without railways, electric cranes, diamond saws, and machine tools. Unfortunately, the builders didn't know this. They didn't think that small. And so they did it. The power for the building is not in steel, but in the mind that is divinely infinite. Yes, we are spirit. The entire universe is spirit. Modern physical science tells us that there exists not a single speck of matter in the universe. Physical science tells us that what we see and touch is made of atoms that are themselves but empty space that is suddenly occupied by particles that are a million times smaller than the shapes that they create, which collectively form the physical universe. And these particles themselves are likewise recognized as but creations of a harmonizing principle that causes moving points of energy to become intelligently arranged so that the universe is without exception the dynamic construct of harmonizing creating principles without which nothing of substance would exist. The universe simply would not exist without them. In this sense, yes, we are spirit and carry on the creation of spirit. Rembrandt illustrates this higher concept with his art. He illustrates the spirit that has shaped us and our culture. Art presents ideas of spirit in ever more advanced physical forms that work with such power that a single line with a pencil can speak volumes, in which he also saw his own image. The art, though, is not in lines that he drew or the colors he chose, but is in the spirit of the creation of spirit that he beheld in the mind when he looked at others, including his children. He conveyed spiritual beauty that cannot be conveyed in any lesser form. The details are not the important part, but the spirit is that the details coming together convey, and there are many such details presented across the world. For example, if one recognizes God being reflected as life and man as the highest manifest, it becomes inconceivable then that one would kill another person. This means that the law of the first commandment becomes fulfilled, not by the force of will, but by the beauty and power of the divine spirit that is the substance and intelligence of all there is. In this sense, humanity and civilization are spiritual through and through. When we see these things of spirit happening in the world, as we bring him out in our living more and more, then the things that we shouldn't see will be no longer happening. They will become impossible to do. At this point, civilization is on track. We are on the mark. The law is fulfilled. Then we will rewrite the Decalogue slightly. We will replace the phrase Thou shalt not, with a new phrase. We will cross out as invalid all nine of the tragic elements, the nine thou shalt not, and put in their place, 
relating to the ugly things, impossible. We cannot, because it isn't doable any longer. When we get to this point, we have come home to reality. This means when we recognize and understand the active governing principle of the universe and man as one package, we can't possibly mess up and do the wrong thing. This will be impossible then. This may be the only thing then that we cannot do. We are not there yet, but we're getting closer. When we get there, wars and terror that had their days of tragedy f fade into oblivion and become forgotten. The same will be said to the burning of food and automobiles, the creation of poverty, the policy for depopulation, the waste of homelessness and unemployment, and so on. When the ancients saw the package of empire and oligarchy being put together, rather than being terrified, they put together a gift for us with which we can untie the package, empty it into the trash bin, and have a future. In the process of getting there, we will also add something to the positive side, to the first commandment. We will add the phrase, everything is possible, we can do. Yes, we can do everything that is constructive, uplifting, enabling, enriching. We can do it all. That's what the ancient builders had said to themselves when the idea emerged to build a complex of pyramids. Their answer evidently was, we can do this, and so they did it. When the designers asked, is it possible to level the rock base perfectly to build the pyramids on, the builders probably nodded and said, we can do this. And they did it. They got the entire area flat to within 15 millimeters. The designers may have further asked, can you cut 2.3 million stone blocks that you need for the big pyramid alone and lay them perfectly square with each side for the big one measuring 756 feet? They would have nodded again, as they knew they could do anything. They placed the four sides, all together measuring more than 3,000 feet in length, with a 58 millimeter overall accuracy. Can you make the ratio of the perimeter to the height of perfect two phi? The designers may have asked. Sure we can, the builders would have said. They accomplished this feat with an accuracy of five one-hundredths of a percent. Can you get the sites perfectly aligned to the spin axis of the earth, the meridian, the designers may have asked. Oh, why not, the builders would have replied. They succeeded amazingly, with an accuracy of three one-thousandths of a degree. They probably said, we can do this. Thus, they built the most accurately aligned structure ever known, and the tallest that would not be superseded for 12,000 years. And they didn't build just one of them. They built three, and to show off what they could do, they aligned them with the stars. This is the result that one gets when the first commandment is fulfilled. What the ancients had pioneered is of critical importance for us today as we face the start of the next ice age in potentially 30 years' time. That's 
when most of the world's agriculture becomes disabled. To compensate for the loss, a new agricultural base will have to be built across the tropics, the flood or in the oceans for the lack of land in the tropics. The necessary project promises to become a gigantic undertaking. However, the physical resources for this already exist. The energy resources exist likewise. Even the technologies exist. But will we respond like the ancients had? Will we say, sure, we can do this? Will we say, we can do everything that needs to be done? The answer evidently depends on how we respond to the first commandment. It involves a complex question that few are willing to consider in today's world. Still, we have the capacity to be fast learners. The most far-reaching element of that question is the most critical element of it. The first commandment demands us to recognize the universe as spirit instead of matter. The difficulty here appears to be the same as that of recognizing the universe as being actively powered by electric plasma streams that pervade cosmic space, instead of seeing everything as being isolated, dependent on the mercy of resources deemed inherent in matter. To say that electric plasma in space does not exist is like saying that spirit does not exist, that all is matter and its manifestation with every sun burning up its hydrogen fuel towards its entropic heat death. On this material platform, we have come to the stage where our energy fuels are becoming rapidly depleted. While the final depletion of everything may be still a few hundred years distant, the fuel resources that we find on our planet are definitely finite and won't get us through the next 90,000-year deep freeze by any means, much less provide the needed energy for an infinite future. In contrast, to say that all is spirit opens up the door to the acknowledgement of the electric universe that brings active electric energy resources to our door for the grasping for a future that can never be depleted. This spirit versus matter conflict is the most critical aspect that the first commandment puts before us at the present time. It bids us to open our eyes and behold our boundless future, where on a lesser material platform no hope remains. Ironically, it is the mythical Moses who says to us in our modern times, No, don't be discouraged. Just open your eyes and rejoice. You have more than just hope. You have the greatest power literally in your hands for an energy and industrial revolution beyond what you can yet imagine as possible. Don't make the mistake the Israelites made. Open your eyes and behold the infinite, 